sorry, I forgot to get my microphone on earlier. We had one minute left, and I was, <gasps> you know. <laughs> oh, yeah, that's, that's probably very true. <laughs> well, praise the Lord, everybody. I am so happy to be in the house of God. I've already felt like God's here with us, and he's ready to do some stuff. I'm excited to see what this service has to in, in store. Amen. Can we, can we just praise God right now? Lord Almighty, I praise and worship you. Jesus, you are so amazing. You are so good. You are so wonderful. Lord, I'm grateful to be in your presence today. I'm grateful to be in your house this morning. And Jesus, I pray that you will help us to follow after whatever it is you might want to do, whatever you want to say to us. Help us hear it, Lord. God, I pray that you will get rid of any, any distractions, anything that's going to be pulling us away from your word today. Lord, I pray that we are solely focused on you, completely focused on what you have in store for us. In Jesus' name, let's clap our hands as we praise God. <laughs> Hallelujah, Lord Jesus. I praise your name. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you.
turn on the microphone. There we go. Amen. God is good. God is so good. Amen. If you have your Bibles, will you open them to the book of 1 Corinthians? We're going to begin, or we're going to continue in chapter 12 this week. And Wednesday night, pastor was teaching, and she was jumping all over what we're going to be hearing today, so if this sounds like it's a repeat, it's a little bit of a repeat, but <laughs> that's okay, amen? amen? I'm very excited about today's lesson. Verse 27 of 1 Corinthians chapter 12 says, now you are the body of Christ and members in particular. Amen. You may be seated. There was quite a lengthy portion of scripture that I did not want everybody standing for, so I threw in verse 27 there so that everybody could stand, and I appreciate you all standing. It is, it is good to give honor to the word of God, but we're going to back up to verse 12 and read to verse 25. If everybody's okay with that, say amen. 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 Let's do it. Verse 12 says, for as the body is one and has many members, and all the members of that body being many are one body, so also is Christ. For by one spirit are we all baptized into one body, whether we be Jews or Gentiles, whether we be bond or free, and have been all made to drink into one spirit. For the body is not one member, but many. If the foot says, because I'm not the hand, therefore I'm not of the body, is he not of the body? Or if the ear shall say, I'm not the eye, and therefore I'm not of the body, is he then out of the body? If the whole body were an eye, then where would the hearing be? If the whole body were hearing, then where would the smelling be? But now hath God set the members, every one of them, in the body as it has pleased him. We've been talking about that a little bit lately, but we're going to continue. And if they were all one member, where would the body be? Now, are they many members, yet one body? The eye cannot say unto the hand, I have no need of thee, nor again to the head, to the feet. The head can't say to the feet that I've got no need of you. Nay, much more of these members of the body, which seem to be more feeble, are necessary. Those members of the body, which we think to be less honorable, upon these we bestow more abundant honor, and our uncomely parts have more abundant comeliness. For our comely parts have no need, but God hath tempered the body together, having given more abundant honor to the part which lacks. And verse 25 says that there should be no schism in the body, but the members should have the same care one for another. Now, we hit a lot of points to talk about just in those few scriptures. And so we're going to do our very best today to do all that under time. We're going to do our very best to talk about it. So we're all one body. We're all one body in Christ. Beyond even just this church, we're one body in Christ. When we go and see fellow believers, they're part of the same body of Christ. We don't, we don't look at them and say, well, oh, you're from Omaha, so therefore you're a completely different breed of Christian. <laughs> oh, you're from California, so therefore you guys are just weirdos and a complete different... No, they're part of the same body. They're part of the same body in Christ. We're all part of one body. There are many members. Everything from the local church to the church organization as a whole. Even in the local church, there are different members, different parts of the body. You, and we're going to talk about it, so I'm going to try not to jump ahead in my notes, but we've got hands, right? The hands don't do what the eyes do. The feet don't do what the ears do. We've got different members for different, different things that we need, right? Our feet can be trained to do what our hands can do, but our hands do it so much better. Our eyes cannot do what our ears can do. Our nose cannot do what our feet do. They can smell. <laughs> Born backwards. Your nose runs and your feet smell. 
Okay, back on topic. <laughs> so we need to make sure there's unity in the body. And I want to just say this as a disclaimer right now. I absolutely love this church. I absolutely love each and every one of you because there is such good unity here. In fact, when I hear about other churches and how there are cliques and how there are people that won't even talk to other groups of people because they're part in the same church in this and there's such disunity and the pastors are banging their head up against a wall trying to figure out what to do about it and teaching on it and, and that just that seems unreal to me because of how blessed I am to be a part of this church so while I'm talking about we need to make sure there's unity in the body please don't think I'm talking about anybody here but even though we have such good unity, doesn't mean we can't realize the importance of it. Right. Amen. We, it's okay to talk about it to make sure we understand how important it is. Amen. So unity in the body, having, having social prejudices, and, well, they're, they're lesser because they were born on the other side of the tracks. They're, they're from that side of town. That's been around for years. It's not something that just popped up in the last hundred years. The church of Corinth was dealing with it. They had divisions because someone was born on the wrong side of the tracks. But Paul says, we've got one spirit. If we look at Romans 12 and 13, it says, by one spirit were we all baptized. I must have put the wrong scripture in there. Well, bummer, okay. Romans something says, for by one spirit are we all baptized into one body, whether we be Jew or Gentiles, whether we be bond or free, we have all been made to drink unto one spirit. There is only one spirit. God does not want us to be identical creatures, though. God gave us individual, individuality. My tongue's not warmed up this morning, guys. I'm sorry. <laughs> individuality. God, God gave us individuality. He wants us to be our own person. When we come into Christ, when we come into God's body, we don't get rid of that. We don't get rid of that and all become a cookie-cutter Christian yeah. where everybody is the same person over and over, where it's all stamped and molded together, and you see one Christian, you've seen them all. That's not what God wants from us. God gave us individuality, and we're going to keep that. Some people for better, some people for worse. We each have our own issues. I don't know. <laughs> Some of them jumping off of that. But God doesn't want us to be cookie, cookie cutter Christians. He gave us individuality, but we do have the spirit that helps guide our lives. We all have the spirit which helps guide our lives. We all have the same body. We might be different people, but we're all part of the same body. Amen? Now, um, let me see. One baptism. The body is made up of believers from different nations. We've got different people. We've got different tongues. We've got different, just wide variety, wide variety of people. But we all have one thing in common. We're all baptized the same way. We're all baptized the same way, which is, which is awesome. It's amazing. In fact, if we look at Ephesians 4 and 3, make every effort to keep the unity of the spirit through the bond of peace. We all have the same DNA through the Holy Ghost. If we look through the book of Acts, and I'm not going to pull the scriptures up, but those of you who are taking notes, we've got Acts 2, 1 through 4, Acts 10, 44 through 47, and Acts 19, 1 through 6. Talk about different races, different nationalities, different people being baptized all the same way. It doesn't matter what color your skin is, it doesn't matter what language you speak, it doesn't matter if you're short, tall, whatever. It doesn't matter on that, we're all, we've all got the same plan of salvation. Right. We're repent, to turn away from our sins, we say, God, I'm sorry, I don't want to do sin anymore. We're baptized in Jesus' name for the remission of those sins, so those sins could be washed away, and we're filled with the Holy Ghost, so that God can help better our lives, and we're, he's God dwelling in us. We all go through that same experience. It is not different for somebody who is 
from the other side of the tracks. They don't have to do an extra step because of where they were born. It doesn't matter if somebody's rich, they don't have to do less steps. It doesn't matter if they're a Jew, you know, God's chosen people. They don't have to do one less step or two less steps. It's all the same for every single person. Amen? We're all baptized in Jesus' name. There is, there is no race or color-specific Jesus for each race. Amen. This, this is something that boggled my mind that I heard about, that different ethnicities had a different Jesus. It's, that's, not, that's not biblically accurate. In fact, if I'm being straight up honest, the paintings we see of Jesus and the depictions we see of Jesus today, that ain't what Jesus looked like. That's a pretty looking Jesus. <laughs> Jesus wasn't pretty. Yeah. And I might, I might offend somebody online, but Jesus wasn't white. <laughs> he was not Caucasian. Yeah. But we're going to jump off of that soapbox before I get in trouble. <laughs> Ephesians 4 and 4 says there is one body, one spirit, even as you are called in one hope of your calling. One Lord, one faith, one baptism. One God and Father of all, who is above all and through all and in you all. So let's break this down just a little bit. One hope, we read in verse 4. Hope is a vital thing for humans. Hope is essential for humans. If you don't have hope, you're miserable. And the, the image that comes to mind, it's a terrible, it's a tragic, it's a sad image, but it's often of POWs through World War I or World War II and how they're in these camps and they're getting the bare minimum food, they're getting the bare minimum water and they're either working or they're just, just trying to make by. You look at their bodies, you look at their faces, you look at their eyes, they're living without hope. They're living just a miserable life. Now, if I was in that situation, I wouldn't have much hope either. I'm not, I'm not trying to be like, they should have had more. No, that's not what I'm saying. Having hope is essential for our human lives. If we don't have hope, we are miserable. The Greek word for hope is elpis, meaning, and I'm pretty sure I pronounced that right. I forgot to look it up. Uh, meaning to anticipate usually with pleasure and expectations. Now, Christians, people living for God, living for Christ, we have hope that God is going to positively affect our lives, that God is going to help guide our lives, sometimes not always through the most fun stuff, but ultimately we have hope in Christ. Amen? One Lord, verse 5. Now, some people that the apostles evangelized to worshipped hundreds of gods. And that's a little g. Hundreds of these little false deity, little g gods. Hundreds. And I can't imagine keeping all of them straight, keeping track of which, because they had a god, this one was for fertility, this one was for the grains, this one was for a good harvest, this one was for the turtles, this one was for the water, this one was for... I'm going a little bit goofy here, but they had, they had hundreds of gods. And it would, it, mind-boggling. I don't know how they kept them straight. I don't, you had to be devout for some of that stuff, but that's not what I'm talking about today. These followers of these false gods would often have to, to be able to communicate with their gods. They would study the animal end trails, or in other words, the internal organs of an animal to be able to communicate with their gods, or they would rely on astrology to communicate with their little g-gods. That's a, a little bit goofy. That's a little bit goofy. Now, the New Testament is built on the doctrine that's applicable to all believers, no, I'm not on the right one, sorry. All throughout the Old Testament and the New Testament is the common theme, one Lord, one God. One Lord, one God. 
Paul wrote to the church in Corinth because they were having divisions. They were having divisions and problems in their church, but he wrote to the book, uh, or he wrote to the church in Ephesus, he wrote the book of Ephesians to encourage them in the unity of faith. Now, in these books and in more, we have plenty of examples of both the Old Testament and the New Testament saying that there is one Lord, that there is one Lord. We have one faith, also found in verse 5. One faith. The word faith comes from the Greek word paistes, which means persuasion, credence, moral conviction. It especially is reliant on the Christ for salvation. The New Testament is built on the doctrines that are applicable to all that believe. We talked about this a little bit before. Unity of doctrine. Unity of of the plan of salvation. Nobody has more steps that they have to do or nobody has less steps that they have to do because they were born on this side of the tracks or because they don't have this amount of money in the bank account. Nobody, it's all the same plan of salvation no matter where you are at in the world, no matter who your dad was, no matter who, it, that none of that matters. It's, an, it's, I'm not hitting on this hammer too much. Okay. None of those factors decide how you are saved. It is all the same. One faith, one baptism for all of us. Amen? So, Members of the body. We read about that in our opening text. Members of the body. How there are different members. Like your hands, your feet, your legs, your eyes, your ears, your hair. Your, there's different members, different parts of your body. Now the human body is remarkable. It is amazing. The way our brain works is astounding. It's, a, it's fantastic. It's wonderful. We as humans have tried to create artificial intelligence, trying to mimic, trying to recreate, even on a small scale, what God did like that. And we try and create it, and we can't get anywhere close. We can't get anything close. We've tried to recreate... I mean, our bodies regenerate. Our bodies heal themselves. They, they fix themselves. They're able to take a broken bone, and if we get it set back in the right place, it heals itself. Our muscles, if they get broken up, they mend themselves stronger. They mend themselves so that that part doesn't break again. The fact that a human can live inside another human as they're being growing and that that's cool that's straight up cool <laughs> until they start kicking right you were talking about that yesterday <laughs> so the fact that that happens a living organism a live i'm a living organism i've got skin on my body i've got fingers i've got toes i'm able to move around i'm able to talk really loud That's amazing. And even after a baby is born, they continue growing. They continue changing. They're they're born with more body or more bones than than they are when they're grown up. And I think that's just cool. The way that changes and it's growing and it's moving and it's a living organism. The thing is, though, the reason I say all that is the church is the same way. The church is a living organism. We're not going to see a giant church made up of people walking around. That's not what I'm saying. I mean, the church itself is a living organism. There are people that are the mouth. There are people that are the feet and the hands. And the, that's the church. It's a living organism. There are many members. The church in Corinth was not that different from some of the stuff we see today. The church in Corinth may not have had fancy electronic wallpaper. The church in Corinth didn't have AC. Thank you, Jesus, for AC and heat and all that. Amen. But they had their individual problems. They still were humans. They still had life 
to deal with. They had divisions in the church. They had problems in the church. It happens. That's part of it. Now, we do not know the source of the division that Paul was writing to talk to them about. We don't know what the source was. Genuinely, we probably don't need to know. Otherwise, God would have told us. I mean, I'm being honest. We don't know what the source was and how it all started, but we do know that it was getting so bad, people in the church were sinning, and the leadership was not taking care of it. Yeah. See, that's one thing I love about our leadership. If we're doing something wrong, they're going to say, hey, I've been noticing this. This is not helping you get close to God. And the reason I'm saying this is because I love you. They're amazing. They're amazing. I, I love them 110 million percent. And so <laughs> the leadership in Corinth, whether it be they didn't want to deal with it or whether it be they were too busy trying to figure out these divisions and these cliques and these schisms and these problems, whatever the matter, whatever the reason was, they weren't dealing with blatant sin in the church. They had all these divisions and they were so caught up in these divisions they were not dealing with and they were not doing what they needed to do. Yeah. So not paying attention to the strength in unity and ignoring the detriments of disunity, Paul steps in and starts writing to him saying, you guys got to have more unity. You guys need to quit worrying about who was born on the wrong side of the tracks and who was, whose dad was this and whose mother was this and somebody was praying this much and versus that much. And so he starts writing to him, um, and in, this is in the book of Ephesians, Ephesians 4 and 16, from whom, from whom the whole body fitly joined together and compacted, by that which every joint supplieth according to the effectual working in the measure of every part, making increase of the body unto the edifying of love itself. In layman's term, you guys all need to work together. You guys all need to work together and start doing it with a little bit of love unto Christ. Amen? Every part fits together. You cannot have a whole church made up of hands. You cannot have a whole church made up of eyes or a mouth. You got to have the feet. You got to have the hands. You got to have the eyes for the vision. You've got to have the mouth for speaking. You've got to have the hands that take care of people. You've got to have the feet that go and spread the gospel. You've got to have all of that in the same church. Every part of the body is essential in the church. There are no unimportant jobs. And that's a problem that we as humans, we like to measure things. We like to look at things and say, well, because he's up behind the pulpit or he gets to sit up on the platform, that's a pretty important job there. All I'm doing is I'm cleaning the toilets, and that's a pretty unimportant job. That's not an unimportant job. Have you seen some of those toilets? <laughs> there are no unimportant jobs, and we like, to, we like to think that there are, but every part of the body is essential, right? I mean, my feet stink. If I wanted to get rid of my feet, how much of a pain would that cause to my body? Not only the, the, the chopping off of my feet, losing a couple inches, but walking around wouldn't be the same. No. Working wouldn't be the same. Even, even trying to do some of the simplest tasks would be completely different. If I got tired of my hands and I got rid of my hands, how detrimental would that be to my everyday life? Yeah. Fixing a bowl of cereal in the morning would become nearly impossible. Every part of the body is important. Every part of the body is important. Even the stuff that we don't like to glorify. Even the stuff that we might see as unimportant. You know, I hate feet. I don't like feet, but I need them. In the church, we need feet to be able to spread the gospel. We need feet for stability. Amen? I'm jumping ahead of my notes. I know I am. Romans 10 and 15 actually talks about feet. 
It says, how shall they preach except they be sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of them that preach the gospel of peace and bring gl glad tidings of good things. Feet provide stability. They provide support. They provide movement. And here's the thing. We might look at one part of our body or another and think, well, that's not really that important. But the thing is, it's all fed, it's all powered, it's all given life by the same blood. The same blood that rushes to our hands when we're using them, that gives them life, keep them from dying, is the same blood that's going to our feet. It's the same blood that's going to our head and our eyes and our ears. In the church, it's the same way. The people that are working behind the scenes that we don't always see what they're doing, those jobs that we, we like to call unimportant, they're fed by the same blood of Christ. They're given the same life as anybody else in the church. Amen? There are no unimportant jobs. Without the brain, we couldn't comprehend obstacles or see a proper path walked. Without the eye, we'd run into a lot of things. Without the feet, it'd be hard to move around. Every part of the body is needed and is important. And when someone is missing, when a part of the body is missing, it affects the whole body. A lot of people like to think, well, I don't do much in the church. I'm not that important in the church, and I'm not needed. Let me tell you something. When, when, you're not, when you're not in service, when you're missing, I feel it. And if I feel it, I'm stubborn and hard-headed sometimes. So if I feel it, I know somebody else is feeling it. Amen? So don't ever think that you're not important. Don't ever think that you're not valued in this church. You are 110% valued. I appreciate the people that are faithful to this church. Amen? Amen. Now, some jobs might be preaching or teaching. Some might be more administrative. Some just could be handing out flyers. Some could be opening the door on Sunday morning and Wednesday night. Or the, the people that set up meals for when somebody has lost a loved one or a surgery or whatever, some, something tragic. That's a very essential part of ministry. That is a very essential part of the church. It's something that we might not see. It's something we might not think about much until it's coming around. The people that do those jobs, that is amazing stuff. That is needed in the church. Amen? Amen. We need the hands for ministering. You can see it in people. You can often read people's emotions through their hands. In fact, when somebody is talking... You can see what they're, you, if somebody sees a closed fist, often that means, oh, he's a little upset. She's not, she's not too happy with me right now. Or if, knock it off. <laughs> or if you've got, you know, oh, it's over there. You can read a lot about what people say through their hands. In fact, this isn't in my notes, it's a funny story. When me and my wife were dating, she was sitting across the table from me, and she's talking, she's just having happy as can be, and I see her hands moving like crazy. Like a couple times, I think they about smacked me because she was just talking with her hands so much. And so I actually, I grabbed her hands and I put them down on the table, and she looked at me and was like, what are you doing? I'm like, oh, nothing, nothing, it's okay. And I held her hands down, and I was like, Continue, continue with your story. And I kid you not, she will, she will confirm it. I kid you not, her hands were covered up by my hands. She couldn't move them. You know, I mean, she could have ripped them out, but she couldn't move them. She couldn't remember what she was saying. Her whole brain had stopped. She wasn't able to remember what she was saying. People talk with their hands. Hands are important, amen. When Jesus was on the earth, he used his hands to reach out and bless the, t the little children and touch them. 
He also touched people to heal them. He touched people to raise them from the dead. These things are essential. These hands are essential. In the church, hands are very important. Amen? We need the people that are willing to reach out and witness, to reach out and show love. Because if you got a mouth trying to do a hands job, you got somebody who just lost a loved one, they don't need... Acts 2.38 says you need to repent and be baptized. That's not what they need. They don't need a mouth. They don't need an eye just sitting there watching them. They need a hand coming over and saying, it's okay. I'm so sorry for your loss. Is there anything I can do? Put my hands to work. Right? They don't need... A mouth speaking to them. They need a hand showing them love. Amen. It's an important part of your body. Amen. It is. Oh, man. I'm almost halfway. I'm maybe just over halfway through. Okay, here we go. The eyes. The eyes. We need the eyes because they see beyond what's just in here. They see what's beyond just in here. God created the eye, and it's remarkable. Our human physical eyes, this is what I was talking about yesterday. <laughs> Our human physical eyes are amazing. They are spectacular. They take light. If we saw the light bouncing around without our eyes being the filters, it would be a mess. It would be a mess. I can only imagine. And so our eyes take and we're able to get colors, and we're able to get shapes, and we're able to see obstacles. And it sends all that information to the brain. Brain's very important, too. Without that, we'd just be seeing stuff, no, no nonsense. Anyway, but here's, here's the really cool part about our eyes. How many people have got a, a camera phone, or a camera on their phone, right? They're roughly about 8 to 10 megapixels. Sometimes they get up to 14 it's, it's a big selling point. The more megapixels, that higher the number is, the better quality the photo's going to be. Yeah. And so a megapixel, one megapixel means it has one million pieces of information per square inch. You take those old-timey phones that had one megapixel or 0.5 megapixels, they took some really grainy photos. Yeah. I've got some good memories with those old phones, but... <laughs> None of those memories are, wow, this is an amazing quality picture. <laughs> so, about 8 to 14 megapixels. Wyatt told me yesterday he's got a camera that takes really good pictures that's about 40 megapixels. Our human eyes, it's been estimated, our human eyes are around 576 megapixels. Wow. That much quality in a couple of little white balls of whatever in our eye, in our head, <laughs> pulling in light. Am I close? Okay. <laughs> now, without the brain, though, our eyes are just getting a bunch of information. Our brain is actually what sorts it and what files it and what need. Hey, that's a danger. Do you see those big, sharp teeth? Let's not go near that. Oh, that's a big drop off. Let's not go near, near that. Without our brains, that would, it would just be like a camera with no memory. Seeing a bunch of stuff, not able to remember any of it. But our eyes are important. Without the vision, the church loses direction, according to Proverbs 29, 18. Where there is no vision, the people perish. Without any vision, the people perish. But he that keeps the law happy is he. Just to finish the scripture out. So, in our opening text that I was reading, it mentioned less honorable members. Less honorable members. Now, this goes again into our human mind and our human natural, we like to measure things. We like to look at different jobs and say that they're less important. Just the same as we might not always see our stomach at work. We might not always see our spleen at work. But 
Has anybody ever had appendicitis? Appendicitis, that, that part of your body, you don't think about it much. Until you do. When it starts getting swollen, when it starts having problems, you notice right away. When you start having an abscessed tooth, you notice, and it doesn't go away. So these less honorable members that it's talking about, it's saying we need to give them more honor. Just because we don't always see what's going on in the background doesn't mean they're not important. Doesn't mean that they're not essential to the body. Think about it. We don't think about breathing very often until now. Now everybody's thinking about breathing. But we don't think about our lungs or our heart beating. But they're working all the time. Without that, right? They're very essential, even though we don't think about it. Um, 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 um. I said all that, said all that. Supportive function. <coughs> the body of Christ needs people working in the background. If you had a whole church of people that wanted to be in the limelight, that wanted to be right where everybody can see them. For one thing, you'd have nobody to see them. That's not the important thing, though. You would have, you would have a church in complete dismay. The carpets would never be cleaned. The toilets would never be, the lawn wouldn't be, the, the roof would probably be blown off by now because nobody was willing to take care of the stuff that needs taken care of. Without those essential parts, the church goes in, into dismay. Disarray. Thank you. You're fine. So, just the same as military. You've got troops on the front lines. You've got troops fighting battles. Our leadership fights battles. I'm telling you what. I, I love you guys, and if God, if God has it, I, I will one day hopefully take over the church. Is that okay to say over the pulpit? And I'm not trying to, now I'm feeling goofy. Now I'm feeling goofy. But they fight. They fight battles. They fight battles galore. Just like the military on the front lines taking care of things, taking care of and fighting those battles, they need troops behind them, bringing them fuel, bringing them ammunition, bringing them food. Because without that, they're not going to last very long. Which is one more reason why I say there are no unimportant jobs in the church. Every single one of you is a valued member of this church. Every single one of you is a very vital part of this church. I'm stepping out of frame here. <laughs> Amen? There are no unimportant jobs. And the battles they face scare me sometimes. <laughs> but they need the support from us. Amen? Amen. Just like it would be hard walking around without a lung or without a heart or without feet. They need every single one of us and more. Amen? Amen. God is no respecter of person. In other words, he doesn't see one person higher than another. He doesn't look at a, at a person behind a pulpit and say that they're they're a much better person than somebody who's sitting in a pew. He doesn't, he doesn't value one person more than another. He will put people where he needs them. It's just the same as an eyeball can't do a foot's job. When it's time for an eye, God is going to use a person. When it's time for feet, God is going to use a person. One job is not more important than another. God is no respecter of persons. In Acts 10 and 34, Peter opened his mouth and said of a truth, I perceive that God is no respecter of person. Preachers and teachers are important. You need preachers and teachers. But so are door greeters. You know how much of a change a door greeter can bring to a person's life? When they walk in, and Brother Rufus, I love you, man. I really love you. When I walk in and I see Brother Rufus and he's smiling, he's just happy for life, right? 
you can talk to him and he'll tell you, it's been a rough week. But he's still smiling. He's not smiling because I'm just going to smile through the pain. He's smiling because he knows how good God is. Amen. And so you walk into the church and you're greeted with somebody that's smiling. That brings a burden off of me sometimes. That brings a weight off of my chest. And you know what? I'm like, you know what? I can do this. This is going to be a good church service. That's a very vital role. That is a very vital role. Amen? The people that are reaching out to new visitors. The people that are setting up meals for somebody who's had a tragic accident. The peop- those, those people. We don't see the work in a church service. We don't see that work. You know, it's not like we're, we're going to sing a few songs and then it's time for those ministries to show their part. We don't see those portions. But they are vital. They are very important. They're every day. They are important. Amen? Amen. Each member has its area of importance. We cannot focus on special roles or special areas. Well, they must be more important because of this reason. No. God is going to use each member as it is needed. Not, there is not somebody who's more special or more important or a, a role that's more important. God uses them as they are needed. Amen? Each one of them is important. And all belong to the body. I might skip a few scriptures here, Matt, but 1 Corinthians 12 and 27 says, Now you are the body of Christ and members in particular. Each member of the body is an individual, unique, but at the same time, we're all tied to the same glorious body of Christ. Each person is essential to the body as a whole. Paul was trying to show the Corinthians in his explanation, saying that, you know, can the hand say, well, I'm not the eye, so therefore I'm not a part of the body. The hands are a very important body, part of the body. The feet can't say, well, I'm not an ear, so therefore I'm not actually a part of the body. Did I get that right? I probably didn't get that right. Anyway, the Corinthians... The Corinthians were having all of these divisions, and Paul was trying to show them, can you get away with not having your feet on your body? Can you get away with not having your hands on your body and it not hurting, it not affecting your life? He's telling them the importance of unity, the importance of having everybody working together. And often, things work together. You know, I'm not at work specifically just using my hands. I need my eyes to see what I'm doing. I need my feet to get my next, go to my next spot. I need my hands to be able to start putting in light bulbs. I need, I need the different parts of my body all working together. And it's the same in the church. We need the different parts of the body working together as a whole. Amen? Amen. Amen. If we could all stand. Without unity, the whole church falls apart. We cannot have our own personal goals in the church. I'm only here so that I can make sure I'm singing every Sunday. I'm only here because eventually one day I'm going to speak at general conference. I hope not. Well, I'm only here because of whatever reason. That, that is having our own personal agenda in the body of Christ. That's, that's not how this works. We're all here to make sure that the kingdom of God grows. Amen? We cannot assume that just because one portion of the body was used, therefore I have to be used too. Because that's only fair. He got to be used in tongues of interpretation, or they got to be used to be able to minister to whatever, so therefore I should be used too. That's not, that's no. God uses people as he sees fit. Amen? Amen? We do not make the decisions on what happens in the kingdom of God. And I'm going to shut my iPad off so that I quit reading and that I actually close like I said I was going to do. Amen?